Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, last week, we looked at 1 John uh, chapter 3, and the focus was on remembering whose we are. We're children of God. And therefore, John told us we're children of the light. So we aim to follow in our Father's footsteps, and, and we confess our sins when we fall short. But in 1 John chapter 4, the message is all about love. And nothing says love like numbers, right? Pound for pound, chapter for chapter. No book in the Bible gives you more loving than 1 John. Only the Gospel of John, Proverbs, Psalms, and Song of Solomon use the word love more. But if you average how often the word love uh, the English word love is used in the book. First John, as you can see, is head and shoulders above the rest. Um, on top of that, uh, the English word that is translated to love is used uh, roughly every other chapter in the Bible. But in First John chapter 4, it's used over 20 times. That's got to be a record. Um, so if you need help with your love life or in any sort of loving relationship, what is love? Well, the best place to look is not a 90s comedy movie or a teen magazine or an online quiz. Just read the book of First John. Like, seriously, reading First John will probably do you more good than any of those things. Um, 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 tells us this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And that's really all you need to remember from this sermon. Uh, a Christian definition of love starts with Jesus and continues with Christians loving one another. Unfortunately, hatred, bitterness, and dissension are much more attention-grabbing and money-making than sincere love and compassion. And uh, we see it so often in our world, as the saying goes, hurt people hurt people. If you're hurt, you tend to hurt people. Other people. That's how trauma and abuse typically work. When we are in pain, our sinful nature wants to lash out at others. When we get mad, we want to blame someone else. However, Jesus offers us another option. Instead of returning hate for hate, we return love since we have been loved. If hurt people hurt other people, then it's also true that loved people can love other people as well. Um, but how can we actually do this? Well, I think if we allow ourselves to be swallowed up by the bitterness, by the nastiness, by the sin in this world, we will. We will inevitably become bitter. If you choose to focus on hate, well, you'll respond with hate. Now, I'm not saying you have to ignore it. We can, and that's not, it's silly to stick our heads in the sands, but we can choose to focus on different things at different times, right? And there's an appropriate way to deal with things. Um, and if you focus more on the love of Christ, if you choose, when you have the choice, to, to focus on looking at the love of Christ, well then, you'll be able to respond more with love to others as well. Uh, now, when we're talking about love, unfortunately, we've got to make sure we're kind of clear on our terms. And the English, English just has one word, love, while Greek has three words. This is not really romantic love that John is talking about, if that's not clear. Although I practically guarantee you that if you adopt these attitudes, your romantic love will be strengthened as well as any other kind of love. And there's so much more that could be said, but for now, it's important to remember sexual love is considered a good part of creation. However, it's like fire or electricity. It's so powerful that for safety reasons, 
It's unwise and frankly dangerous when it gets out of control. And John is all about connectivity, but it's within the context of Christ-like love. And in the Bible, it's also important to remember that um, love is not just a feeling. Um, all Christian love starts with Jesus, really. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. And it starts with, and it continues, it starts with Jesus and it continues with concern for others. Christian love is certainly not focused exclusively on me, what I'm thinking or what I'm feeling. No, love starts with God who gave himself up for us as an atoning sacrifice. Christian love starts with Jesus' death for us because, well, he loves us. Christian love often starts with sacrifice, not self-fulfillment. And one of the easiest ways to torpedo love these days, I think, is getting sucked in by bitterness. So my, my encouragement is to avoid getting sucked down the toilet of bitterness. Because bitterness does operate like a toilet, and, and it will suck you down into the sewers. And uh, as Christians and as a Christian community, uh, we, we can't really offer the world anything if we're just like the rest of the bitter, divided world out there. Our foundation is love, particularly the kind of sacrificial, compassionate, suffering love of Christ. People need love, and they don't just need any kind of love or a, a cheap imitation kind of love or a self-serving love. People need the love of Christ in their lives. And that starts, well, among you and me and how we treat each other in this congregation. John puts it this way, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Now, we are called, as John says, to love one another. But it's you know, sometimes tempting to gossip about somebody rather than to sit down and have a conversation about a, a problem or grievance or disagreement you might have with them. Uh, you know, and these days, it, it, you know, it's just so much at the forefront of so many things. We, we all have different opinions about different things that are going on about national issues or folks in Washington. But, but for you and me, when it comes to you and me, we've got to love each other. <clears throat> and admittedly, it's sometimes, hard, it's sometimes hard to work with people who have different personalities from our own. It's hard to be patient. And sometimes we're hard to work with. Uh, and people have to be patient with us as well. And that's why in loving one another, there has to be forgiveness. And that's also why I encourage you, if, if you've got a serious problem with me, please come, come talk to me. Sometimes I say things the wrong way. Sometimes I probably say the wrong thing. Or my communication breaks down. Or sometimes uh, we, one or both of us might learn something from a conversation we might have together. And please, not so much for my sake, but for the sake of the church, if you've got a real problem with me, please, please come talk to me. I, if I've done or said something that's seriously bothering you, I want to resolve it at least as much as we can and fix it so we can move forward. I, you know, the, the church can't get along. We can't get along if we won't reconcile. That's what the church is all about. And we can't, we certainly can't reconcile if we don't talk to one another. Um, and how in the hell of this world can we claim to offer something of value to the world if we can't offer a bit of heaven in our own interactions? Forgiveness is divine. And that's the, the foundation, that's a cornerstone of our church. <coughs> And so instead of festering bitterness or fostering hate towards one another, let's get it out on the table. And, and for Christ's sake, forgive one another whatever grievances you have against each other. 
If you want to be bitter and hold on to your hatred and anger and hurt, well, then you're hanging out with the wrong Savior. Because Jesus forgave those who spit upon him, who whipped him, and nailed him to a cross. In the light of that, I think you and I, we can forgive one another. Um, on the other hand, and this is what we get to see uh, as a reality, and it's so beautiful when we do see it, isn't it refreshing to feel love from people around you in church? I imagine all of us could tell stories of how we have been really affected or helped or you know, ministered to by uh, fellow grace members. And what a beautiful thing when we're showing love to one another in, you know, in any variety of ways on Sunday mornings, but not just on Sunday mornings, outside of church as well. And we can certainly thank God for so many people, so many volunteers who give of their time and energy and effort to make sure that church can, <clears throat> can operate and that it looks warm and welcoming or that we have special music or that clean, the church is cleaned up after every week. I mean, it takes a lot of work, and it's easier for me to see that sometimes than for, uh, for, for when you're out. But when, you're in the, or when you see the organization and you see all that's going on, it's easy to see just how much love and, and care for one another it takes to keep something like this going. And uh, that's a, a wonderful testimony to the love of God in the way that we care for one another. And caring for one another makes a genuine difference and creates a positive atmosphere. And that, that's what our world is desperate for. It's what our world needs. And so our message, we could have said it in, well, John did say it in one or two sentences. It's pretty simple. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. In Jesus' name, amen.